Celebrating 43 years on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, a USDA program lets local butcher shops meet demand from farther away. Plus, gas prices edging up could be encouraging news for an ethanol recovery. In Southern Gardening, how'd you like to have a carpet of color in your yard this summer? Gary's got the DIY. And in our feature, an encore. They grew the family business the old-fashioned way. They earned it. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. Good to have you with us today on Farm Week. Recently we ran a story about local meat processors around the country stretched to the limit by customers unable to get what they wanted at the grocery store. But there is an existing USDA program that allows certain smaller processors to reach customers further away. Peter Tubbs has that story. The USDA program that allows small state inspected meat processors to sell product across state lines has added another name to its lineup. The Cooperative Interstate Shipment Program, administered by the USDA and seven participating states, grants approval to smaller meat processors, allowing them to change their business models from a local focus to one that touches all 50 states. 66 companies in six states currently have approval to ship nationally and Iowa became number seven when it reached a deal with the USDA in May. So if we uh, provide that service, they're restricted to be able to only be able to resell that product within the state of Iowa. This allows them to enter into larger distribution networks, maybe organic grass-fed or pasture-raised pork or some of these especially smaller farm type things and be able to ship those uh, around the country and even around the world. There are 68 Iowa processors that meet CIS criteria, and Gustafson is one of 13 processors to apply to the Iowa Department of Agriculture. State and federal slaughter, processing, and inspection rules are similar, with states having more leeway to reach standards equal to those specified in the federal rules. Among those differences are labeling, which must match USDA guidelines. The CIS was part of the 2008 Farm Bill, and allows for slaughterhouses or meat processors with an average of fewer than 25 employees to receive approval for sales nationally. Ohio was the first state to receive approval in 2012 and has the largest number of CIS processors at 25. The primary beneficiaries of the program are processors that reside close to state borders, companies that want to expand their markets, and processors that wish to sell online. It's really uh, a great thing for small processors. Um, it's going to allow uh, us to provide more services and to even um, distribute specialty products even farther. And a lot of the small processors are in small rural communities, which provides more jobs and more opportunities than in those communities. Vendors are hopeful they can receive final approval this summer. Needless to say, the coronavirus outbreak has had a huge impact on America's driving habits. We're driving fewer miles. OPEC has floated the idea of extending production cuts and gas prices have edged upward. That is encouraging to ethanol producers hoping to rebound from a catastrophic spring. Once again, here's Peter Tubbs. As American ethanol plants come back online, producers may find a steep grade slowing their return to pre-pandemic production levels. Restarting the 35% of ethanol production that is still idled will require the American consumer returning to their 2019 driving habits. But changing work routines could be a long-term drag on gasoline sales. Dan Brazi is a consultant with Ag Resource, a Chicago, Illinois-based financial risk management company. Or if America changed its driving habits because of homestay, there's a lot of corporations in my town in Chicago where people are going to continue working from home. They won't make that commute into Chicago. Uh, that's something that will longer term have a structural impact on U.S. energy consumption, which thereby affects ethanol consumption. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, gasoline consumption peaked in the summer of 2016 and was down 8 percent before the economy was upended by COVID-19 lockdowns. Reduced driving may also affect the math of the renewable fuel standard. 
But as we think of ethanol, you know, the U.S. ethanol mandates that are set each year by the EPA are directed upon miles driven in America. So if we Americans drive fewer miles, the 15 billion gallon mandate will come down. Returning ethanol production to its 16 billion gallon peak will require an increase in exports. While export volumes rose from 10 million barrels to 40 million barrels between 2010 and 2018, exports represent less than 10 percent of U.S. ethanol production. I, I think uh, residual production, as I call it, stuff that's not used domestically, will have to be exported. Slow growth in ethanol production will be welcomed by the corn market, but a healthy corn crop will increase stocks and potentially depress prices. Well, I, I, I think the farmer needs to think forward. I, I mean, as we look at where corn prices and soybean and wheat prices are today, you know, I hate to say it, but there's still more downside risk, even with the ethanol industry in this recovery mode. A few days ago, a federal appeals court overturned the EPA's approval of a chemical used routinely on millions of acres. The decision comes as farmers are about to finish soybean planting and move on to other crops. Now it's one less tool in the toolbox. From our news partner, Market to Market, Josh Pittner reports. The Environmental Protection Agency's approval of the chemical dicamba was struck down this week by a federal appeals court. Dicamba is widely used in cotton and soybean acres and first gained approval in 2016 for a two-year license on a new version designed for genetically modified crops. The Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals said in their ruling, quote, the toxicity is not limited to weeds. The chemical has been at the center of disagreements between landowners that ended in an Arkansas farmer's murder back in 2016. The appeals court said EPA overstated the protections and understated or ignored environmental and economic risks. In 2017, hundreds of growers in multiple states reported problems with dicamba damaging nearby non-target fields. Monsanto, one of the companies with a new formulation of dicamba designed to be less prone to volatization, turning from liquid to vapor, said it investigated about 1,200 complaints and believe 80% of the problems occurred when farmers or other applicators failed to follow existing label requirements. In response to concerns, the Environmental Protection Agency did toughen labeling requirements in October of that year. At that time, those who planned to apply the reformulated chemicals were required to take more training. North Carolina producer Joe Gardner told Market to Market in 2018 he immediately knew something had gone wrong when he walked into one of his tobacco fields that year. The unnatural cupping on the leaves was similar to curling he had seen during the summer, after which he received a settlement for crop damage due to suspected dicamba exposure. But this time, almost 100 acres, nearly a third of his tobacco crop, showed signs of exposure. And I saw it that Monday, that Monday night. I ain't hardly slip a wink, not knowing what, what I was going to lose if I couldn't settle with somebody. The agribusiness giant still faces several lawsuits related to its dicamba herbicide. In 2017, drift during application damaged more than 3.6 million acres of soybeans and other crops in 25 states. Bayer, the now parent company of Monsanto, criticized the ruling but there has been no indication if the verdict will be appealed. So, in the mood for a carpet of color this summer? Well, you're in the right place. In Southern Gardening this week, Gary Bachman showcases four plants designed to give you that backyard burst you're looking for. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Here's Gary. plants that make colorful carpets during the summer months. Here are a few of my favorites. I like to recommend the Cora Cascade Vinca because of the heavy production of colorful flowers. Cora Cascade Vinca produce plants with good branching and spread up to 36 inches wide. The trailing growth habit is perfect for showing off the big and showy flowers that come in colors of cherry, lilac, peach blush, polka dot and strawberry. Purslane is one of those plants that are perfect for carpeting many places in your garden. Purslane forms a dense mat of drought resistant color. 
It also does great in small patches as well. Purslane is a tough summer plant for our Mississippi heat that has become a flowering favorite of mine. Ornamental sweet potatoes are perfect for laying a gorgeous carpet of vivid and attractive leaves. These plants are vigorous and produce thick mats of color. The Sweet Caroline series offers a wide selection of heart-shaped and cut leaf foliage in a variety of colors for the landscape. Foliage colors include light green, purple, red, and bronze. Tangerine Beauty Crossvine is perfect to create a vertical carpet of color like it's doing scrambling up and over this entrance arbor. It's simply covered in flowers. The flower buds are pinkish red and open into funnel shaped orange, salmon, and yellow flowers. There's nothing like planting a floral carpet of color to create landscape interest. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I hope you'll join me next time on Southern Gardening. Time for a short break, but stay put. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, a story that could start with a joke, but trust me, this is no laughing matter. One man says it could be a national security issue. We're in Pennsylvania, a state that produces all by itself two-thirds of the entire American mushroom supply. In fact, one county calls itself the mushroom capital of the world. There's a lot more to this industry than meets the eye, though. We go behind the scenes, coming up on Farmwick. Don't go away. It's a simple idea. Knowledge that transforms lives shouldn't be limited to those on a campus, but extended to any and all who want or need it, wherever they are. At Mississippi State University, we've been making that possible for more than 100 years through the MSU Extension Service. What began as an effort to extend the latest research to farmers has become something much more. Today, we're helping Mississippians from all walks of life, giving them the tools they need to build a brighter future. We're sparking the imagination of students around the state and inspiring the next generation of doctors. We're helping rural communities find their way to the internet and connect to the world at large. And we're teaching families how to lead healthier lives in ways both big and small. MSU is standing firm in its commitment to that one simple idea. Extend the knowledge that transforms lives wherever they are. Before we get back to the show, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. If you're reinventing yourself in the coronavirus era, how about some professional development classes? Mississippi State University Extension is offering 10 different classes, all of them free through June 30th, so not that much time left to get registered, and all self-paced online. If you're looking for work or just want some new skills, any one of these could be helpful. Choose from 12 steps to a successful job search. Small business marketing on a shoestring. Marketing your business on the internet. Creating web pages. Creating WordPress websites. Fundamentals of supervision and management. Individual excellence. Personal finance. Managing customer service. And keys to effective communication. Again, all these courses are free through June 30th, and you have a full three months to complete the course once you're enrolled. Interested? Visit ce.extension.msstate.edu or for more information contact Dixie Cartwright at DLC10 at msstate.edu. Time now for the market report. As you might suspect, the market's anything but predictable these days. Zach's got it all in perspective though in today's outlook. Zach? Thanks Mike. Futures slid down a bit this past week, refle reflecting both a market correction and a reminder that COVID's still a problem. Let's take a look. As you can see, drops weren't too severe, mostly under $3. Biggest gain? Soybeans, up $3.75. Biggest loss? Lumber, down $14.70. Let's give that drop a little context. A year ago, lumber was $392. But on February 20th of this year, it was $463. Why do I tell you that? Because I think right now we're in a correction stage. We'll keep an eye on that one. And speaking of corrections, this month's supply and demand report tells us the market is rebounding, slowly. U.S. wheat supplies up thanks to larger crops, although final stocks on a six-year low. 
Coarse grains look unchanged from last month. Corn for ethanol down, as Mike told you earlier, due to slow rebound of fuel. Rice predicted larger supplies, lower exports, and increased imports. Soybeans looking at higher crush and lower exports. Livestock and poultry production increased, although turkeys have decreased. Finally, cotton's expected a 200,000 bale decrease in mill use. As you saw earlier, wheat futures down. Many reasons for that. You've probably seen less flour at the grocery store. If you're a bread maker like me, it's a challenge. Why? Supplies regrowing stock lost from the quarantine. COVID caused slower production that can't keep up. Essentially, supply chains challenged, as we said would happen. Customers buying up staples left and right. As stated by King Arthur Flour, by now you've probably witnessed empty flour shelves at your grocery store and back-ordered items on our website. Demand for these products has sharply multiplied in past weeks, outpacing the speed at which new products can be created and delivered, even as our mills run at full capacity. In some cases, getting more product onto shelves has been delayed within stores themselves as many struggle with fewer staff, reduced hours, and other challenges related to COVID-19. Our supply chain and logistics team is actively working with stores and distributors across the country to get our flour back on the shelves of grocery stores and national retailers. And that's just one company facing the issue. So, wheat is cheaper. That should mean plenty of stock. Yet the supply chain struggling to keep up. I don't think this will be a problem for long. As the quarantine declines and savvy distributors adapt, we'll see an end to this issue in the coming months. Market analyst Naomi Bloom gives us the commodity side. She says the WASD report understated final harvest numbers. Combination of harvest pressure and the USDA report for the old crop um, wasn't as friendly as what people were hoping. So you hit the nail on the head. We've got wheat harvest going on, and it's going to be interesting to find out where those yields are coming in at because some people feel that the yield numbers are going to be less than what the USDA is representing. Uh, separately, on the USDA report that we had this week, the new crop number for the all wheat ending stocks was actually favorable, coming in closer to 925 million bushels. It's one of the smallest numbers we've seen for five or six years, but the market couldn't rally on that just because the global world carryout numbers, again, a new record large amount. So we're stuck with this battle of um, plenty of supplies around the world. Things might get interesting here at home. And then balancing that along with even spring wheat prices and what the spring wheat market's going to do is there's a lot of uncertainty as far as what did for sure get planted up in the northern plains. Soy sales on the upswing with Brazil's supply lowering and their currency improving. Prices are rising and we're nearly done with planting. China's imports also encouraging. According to the USDA, they bought 1 million tons in the marketing year of 2019 and 2020, ending in June. Why? According to analyst Arlen Suderman, China's stockpiling because they believe COVID-19 will hinder future exports. In essence, China thinks they've seen the worst of it, but we haven't. When it hits, exports may shut down. At least that's the working theory. On the other hand, Naomi Bloom says prices are looking to rally soon. Well, I do think that we will see some sort of a weather rally here in the short term. The summer high is usually between the middle of June to the first part of July, and that's it. It'll be a three or four week rally, and if you've got to make those cash sales as the market goes higher. And the emphasis will be on making sure that we are really aggressive on making those cash sales on the rally because of the potential for the corn ending stocks to be so big. And, and what if we get some sort of a black swan event and then the market prices fall apart lower? So do make sure that we're plugging away on those cash sales on the rally this summer. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Let's keep our heads about us. We're almost to the end of quarter two. Mike? That's good advice. Thanks, Zach. In today's Encore feature, a great success of family mushroom business in Pennsylvania, where more mushrooms are grown than in any other state in the country. It's not one of the easiest businesses to be in, but with this kind of persistence, there's a payoff like few other. Colleen Bradford Krantz has the story. Anyone in southeastern Pennsylvania worth their weight in Maitake knows the story of how the mushroom industry began here. It's not about the area's climate, terrain, or soil. The mushrooms all started back in the late 1800s. When a carnation grower's son saw a waste of space under the carnation beds. In a Kennett Square city market, similar to this one in New York City. 
He was very fastidious and wanted to make the best use of all the resources. Took a steamship to Europe where they were growing mushrooms in Paris. And he brought in the mushroom spawn. So in 1902, uh, Swain and a fellow named Harry Hicks built the first building uh, specifically to grow mushrooms. Industry started to take root, support companies sprung up, and it just mushroomed into what it is today. Today, Pennsylvania is the nation's top producer of mushrooms, growing and picking 67% of the United States' 827 million pounds of the most commonly cultivated mushrooms, such as white button. California comes in a distant second, raising 11%. Chester County, and specifically the community of Kennett Square, have labeled themselves the mushroom capital of the world. The city of 6,000 holds an annual mushroom festival, serves mushroom-focused dishes in nearly every restaurant, and even has a mushroom-themed gift shop. It's great for the economy here in Chester County, and you know, the industry probably employs probably 10,000 people, and it's, it's amazing. There's always jobs. We need pickers. We need all kinds of people in the industry. Yet it's not always an easy business. A new report from the National Agricultural Statistics Service shows the volume of all U.S. mushrooms slipping 10% over the past three years. Jim Angelucci, general manager of Phillips Mushroom Farms, says the startup and overhead cost are significant for those trying to get into the business. Labor, however, has perhaps been the biggest problem as some companies struggle to hire enough workers to pick their mushrooms. Like many dairy farmers, mushroom producers are not allowed to hire temporary international workers under the H-2A visa program because the work occurs year-round. Since we grow mushrooms 24-7, 365, we're not considered seasonal. My comment is, you know, our crop's only nine weeks long. We just elect to do it six and a half times a year. If we don't do something, I consider it a national security issue. Uh, we've got to have labor, and we're going to lose the salad bowl in California if we don't get labor. Phillips Mushrooms has been around for 92 years and is now the world's largest grower of exotic mushrooms. Angelucci said finding labor is still a battle for the company, even with a new state-of-the-art mushroom farm the company built just across the state line in Warwick, Maryland. Growers pick inside climate-controlled buildings with humidity and temperature set to the perfect range for mushrooms. However, that doesn't isolate the company financially from consequences of extreme weather. We don't have to deal with the elements uh, directly. We do, um, you know, when it's 105 degrees here in, in the summer and our electric meters are spinning off the wall because of the electricity we're using to cool the rooms, that's a direct effect of, of the weather. The cost of doing business continues to escalate, the cost of compliance uh, with the government. The Warwick facility, where additional buildings are still being constructed, features stainless steel rather than the traditional wooden growing shelves. The complex was begun when the company decided to return to growing large volumes of white button mushrooms, which it had moved away from. The stainless steel shelves are easier to wash down when the compost, or substrate, is changed after a batch of mushrooms is harvested. Our Maryland facility is its called the Dutch style of growing. We decided when we were going to venture back into growing white agaricus mushrooms in 2009 that we would look at state-of-the-art facilities to do that, food safety being the most important factor. So we spent a couple years going back and forth to Europe before we, we finally decided on the design. The mushrooms, as they have always been, are grown in a special type of substrate. Stall bedding from a nearby horse track is used, as is old straw and hay, preventing that material from being tossed into a landfill. Some of the area's mushroom farmers own the composting facility as a shared cooperative, and the materials are blended and prepared for all. Angelucci, even before working for the Phillips, new mushroom farming and how to work with the substrate. My father told me when I was nine years old to put something on the table beside my elbows. So he took me down to uh, our friend, mushroom farmer down the end of the street, the Avello brothers, and I was a little kid on top of the pile with a hose, making sure that we had enough water in the compost to make sure that it reacted properly. Angelucci feels good about where the company and industry are heading, particularly if the labor problem can be resolved. 
and recent studies point to a possible connection between eating white button mushrooms and inhibiting the development of breast cancer in older women. The Mushroom Council is encouraging Americans who are considering becoming vegetarians to instead blend chopped mushrooms into their ground meats, becoming blenditarians. It's actually not replacing meat. Research has shown that the increase in beef because of the blend, uh, they have an incremental sales increase because people feel better about eating it now. A blenditarian is one who believes that the meaty, mighty mushroom makes meals more nutritious, delicious, and sustainable. If you didn't catch it, Phillips has been in business more than 90 years through four generations. A great family story. Well, next week, it won't be too long before we introduce you to this year's Logger of the Year. But before we do, a look back at the reigning logging champion. The U.S. has more than 750 million acres of forest land in Mississippi. Nearly a million and a half truckloads of lumber came out of woods, uh, the woods last year. Once again, meet Drew Sullivan, who helped make all that possible. That's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Stay healthy. Thanks for watching.